The following is a selected video from masterthecontent.com where you will find an extensive video library of lectures for a variety of standardized admission tests. We offer over 600 hours of detailed video lectures for a multitude of standardized tests. Use our interactive in-lecture table of contents to find specific topics of interest. Work through numerous in-lecture examples to help you internalize concepts. To learn more, visit masterthecontent.com. Your career, our passion. What we're going to do in the next slide here before we actually move on to morphological classification of bacterial cells is I want to summarize the major differences between prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells. Now, pay attention on this slide. This is important and a lot of sections actually would be drawn from this sort of information. So when we're talking about the genetic material of these organisms, what's different? What do prokaryotic cells have or not have that eukaryotic cells have? We've already talked about it. So the genetic material in prokaryotic cells will primarily consist of a single circular chromosome. Whereas in eukaryotic cells, eukaryotics, you're going to find them typically having varying numbers of paired chromosomes. So we have a single circular chromosome in the case of prokaryotic cells, and we have typically paired chromosomes uh, in the case of eukaryotic cells. Now, what about the location of the genetic material? Remember I talked about the nucleoid? In the case of prokaryotic cells, they do not have a nuclear membrane or a nuclear envelope, and their genetic material in the cell is actually located in a region referred to as the nucleoid. Now what the nucleoid is, it's just an ill-defined, irregular region inside uh, the prokaryotic cytoplasm where the genetic material is located. So it's not housed, it's not protected by a membrane, it's just there contained in a region we refer or we call the nucleoid. Now, on the flip side, eukaryotic cells actually have a very well-defined membrane that encloses uh, the genetic material. So they have a membrane-enclosed nucleus, which is another distinguishing feature uh, that you'll find in eukaryotes and not in prokaryotes. And remember, when I'm talking about prokaryotes, I'm talking about both the domains bacteria and archaea. So uh, organisms that belong to those both of those domains. Now, what about uh, the nucleolus and the histones. Now, if you've forgotten what a nucleolus is or what a histone protein is, I'll remind you, a nucleolus is basically um, a round body that's found inside the nucleus of a eukaryotic organism. And why the structure is important is it's where ribosomal synthesis takes place. If you remember your first year of very basic biology, the nucleolus is where ribosomal synthesis will take place in eukaryotic cells. Now on the flip side, a histone protein, it's just basically a positively charged protein or a basic protein that actually associates or binds to DNA because DNA is negatively charged. And it forms this, these small units that we call nucleosomes. So nucleosomes are basic units of organization. So what a histone protein will do to DNA, it'll cause it to clamp up or to condense into these structures we call nucleosomes, which makes it much easier to pack DNA together. So as you can see, these are two structures that are serving very important functions as far as the functioning of a cell is concerned. And we're only going to find them in eukaryotes. We will not find them in prokaryotes. So that's another distinguishing feature uh, between those two groups of organisms. Now, what about the ribosomes? In prokaryotic cells, we have what we call 70S ribosomes. And in eukaryotic cells, we have 80S Ribosomes. So what a 70S ribosome is basically a ribosome that consists of a small ribosomal subunit, uh, a 30S subunit, and a large unit that is about 50S. So what S is, S just basically stands for uh, the Svedberg unit. I'm going to spell that out for you actually if you're interested in knowing what that is. It's not particularly crucial information, but that's the Svedberg unit. I'm not even sure if I'm pronouncing it correctly. Now. What this Svedberg unit does is that it characterizes the behavior uh, of particles in sedimentation processes. So remember what sedimentation is when something trickles down in a suspension. Uh, and the most notable sedimentation process I can give you an example of is centrifugation. Now those of you that have dealt with some organic chemistry and know uh, or have a good understanding of separation techniques, what a centrifuge does is just it spins a suspension containing dissolved substances at such a high speed that makes them settle at the bottom, makes them sediment. So what the S in these ribosomal numbers means, it's just basically a unit. Uh, 
uh, it's this coefficient that tells you how quickly a uh, bacterial ribosome, a 70S ribosome, will sediment to the bottom, or how quickly a eukaryotic ribosome, an 80S ribosome, will sediment to the bottom if you centrifuge it. So don't worry about that. That's just an additional piece of information that you don't need to know. But what you do need to know is that prokaryotic cells have 70S ribosomes, eukaryotic cells have 80S ribosomes. Now, that summarizes the differences as far as their genetic structures are concerned. What about other cellular structures? So as far as the cell wall is concerned right here, prokaryotes, as I said, they usually have pretty complex cell walls. Uh, and as you'll see later on this, in this lecture, they have additional structures on top of their cell walls. And they usually have a compound referred to as peptidoglycan in those cell walls. Now on the flip side, eukaryotic cells have relatively simpler cell walls, and they do not have that compound peptidoglycan in their cell walls. An example of eukaryotic cell walls would be the cellulose uh, that you find in plant cells, or the chitin that you find in fungal cells. So that's a key difference between prokaryotes and eukaryotes, the presence of peptidoglycan in prokaryotic cell walls and its absence in eukaryotic cell walls. Now, what about key organelles? I'm talking about the mitochondria, the chloroplasts the uh, endoplasmic reticula, the Golgi apparatus, uh, the um, lysosomes, peroxisomes, uh, cytoskeletal elements, those are all organelles that are present in eukaryotic cells, but absent in prokaryotic cells. So that's huge. So right off the bat, if you were given, say, for instance, an electron micrograph of a prokaryotic cell and one of a eukaryotic cells, and you weren't told what was which, you should be able to identify the few based on the fact that you will not see any cellular organelles in the prokaryotic cells. So as you can see, uh, that's another key difference. Now, the last thing I'm gonna talk about is the differences in reproduction, the reproductive differences. So prokaryotic cells will reproduce sexually, asexually. So they'll do so asexually, and the mechanism they'll use to do that is a process we refer to as binary fission, where the cell pretty much doubles its genetic material and splits into two. Now, on the flip side, eukaryotic organisms can reproduce both sexually and asexually. So they have the ability to do both, depending on what eukaryotic organism you're talking about. And the process that they use to do that is either mitosis, meiosis, or a combination of both, depending on the complexity of the environment. So here we have two key distinctions. The division or the cell division processes, process that primarily happens in prokaryotes is binary fission, the splitting of those cells. Whereas in eukaryotic cells, if they're going to divide, it will typically, typically result uh, from a mitotic or a meiotic uh, process. So it'll be a mitotic or a meiotic division. Now, prokaryotes can only reproduce asexually, although they do have mechanisms through which they can share genetic material, We'll talk about that later on in this lecture, whereas eukaryotic cells actually uh, can also produce both sexually and asexually. So what I want us to do next is move on from bacterial taxonomy and head into bacterial morphology. So we're going to talk about the morphological classification of bacterial cells.